Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Let's start our video with a story from Australia during the brush fire season. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Flick a lit cigarette aside in midsummer, will you? I walked into work today, a small cafe, on my day off to grab a coffee. A couple of car parking spaces before I get there, a newish convertible pulled up and the guy that got out flicked his half-smoked cigarette aside. In the middle of summer in Australia. Serious brush fire season. No, I don't think so. I'd never do this if I had time to think, but acting on instant, overwhelming indignation, I picked up the cigarette and threw it onto his car seat, still burning. Yeah, probably increases the risk of fire more than a cigarette in a country town footpath, but I never claim not to be a hypocrite. And our second story. Lock me out of the free parking lot so I have to pay? Okay. When I worked in Boston, I used to take the commuter rail in. There was a small lot that was not an MBTA lot, which abutted the pay $2 per day lot that the MBTA ran. For five years, I parked in this small lot with several other regulars, including MBTA conductors, who all wanted to save five to $600 per year. One day, I pull into the lot and discover that there's a padlock on the gate, which has been chained shut. I see Dave, our regular conductor for the 7.25 a.m., just clicking the lock home and roll down my window and ask him, Hey Dave, what gives? New policy. Only MBTA employees can park here now. The lot was small, and when we regulars parked there, some of the conductors and other sundry train people had to pay. I grumble and dig for change, which is composed of nickels and dimes left over from fast food purchases. Quarters were for tolls. On the way home, I stop at CVS in Boston and pick up my own padlock. I get to the lot, and instead of rushing with the rest of the cattle to our cars, I confidently walk over to the gate of the little free lot and place my lock, to which only I have the keys on the chain. The conductors don't get to their cars until after the turnaround and cursory cleanup happens. I live at the end of the line. The next morning, I see that the gate is wide open, my lock has been bolt cut and is laying on the ground under a no longer used chain. I park, conductor Dave is getting out of his car, we exchange the nod, and I walk with him to the platform. Other regulars are pulling in and getting out of their cars now, along with the other MBTA folks that are there in time to snag a free spot. So what happened to the new policy? I innocently asked Dave. Too much trouble, he says. Besides, I think the laundromat actually owns the land and they got PO'd and locked us in last night. Had to go find bolt cutters to get us out. Do tell, Dave, do tell. For the next two years that I worked in Boston, nary a problem. Total savings, $3,500. Screwing the MBTA, priceless. And our last story. You only want me working part-time in case there isn't too much work next year? Sure. I must confess I have a profound respect for people who don't take crap from their employers. You're my heroes, and so I hope my story can help someone else. Okay, so first some necessary background info. I live in a small country and I'm an engineer in a very niche field. Where I live, there are 15 to 18 people in my field in the whole country. Also, unions are a good thing here, and most companies are fine with unions. The employee benefits from this, but so does the employer, since the rules of the game are very clear. Clear for most people, as my employer was about to find out. My story goes like this, and it took place late 2019 until late 2020. My team consisted of three people, me included, and one on our team, our mentor, was ready to retire two years prior to this happening, but he stayed on because you know, codependence issues, I guess. We had 10 to 12 years experience each. We were just younger and more inexperienced than our mentor who has 40 plus years experience. I really envisioned us taking over the team soonish. Company's a large actor where I live, but things had not been going great for the shareholders for some six months prior to all this happening. Knowing this, I decide I'll not ask for a raise in my annual performance review to show I'm a team player and explicitly state this to my boss's boss, Mr. V. All's fine and well for three months. Then the bomb drops. 
One fine autumn day in 2019, I was called to a meeting with my boss, Mrs. G. Mrs. G told me they didn't expect there to be enough work to go around for my team next year. COVID-19 had not struck yet, so that wasn't the reason. So they wanted to cut me down to a part-time job, working only 80%. That'd be about four days a week, starting three months hence. I immediately asked if this is also the case for my other coworker and if our mentor was going to retire. Well, yes, but no. My coworker would also be offered 80%. Our mentor was going to be working 60%. And I'm like, what? He really wants to retire, you know? Well, he's not yet, says Mrs. G, because of reasons and stuff. Okay. So I signed the new contract but feel bad about it since I was really trying to be a team player and didn't feel my employer was taking responsibility for us employees, but only thinking of the shareholders. I also get the feeling that they don't see me or my coworker taking over the team anytime soon, despite us not being novices in the field, I immediately start planning for the future. After this happens, I start asking around if other employees are also facing part-time employment due to no projects in 2020. As one does, you want to know how others are doing, right? Nobody else is getting part-timed, and everyone else is appalled. Just the three of us. We're singled out for some reason. Some of our colleagues even say that they've had stints of no work for months without any actions taken in this regard. There's now general displeasure in my team toward our employer. Since our mentor just wanted to retire and let us do the job, there would not have been any reason to have us younger engineers working part-time, really. But no, because of reasons. And stuff. Okay, so what to do? I have a family and two kids, mortgages in the lot, and this would be a blow to the family income, so I start planning to do some work on the side. Since I'm an engineer, I can do consulting, right? My employment contract says no, but if my employer cannot or will not offer me a full-time job, the union contracts say I can do whatever I want with the rest of my time and my employer cannot interfere. I also have the right to refuse more work from my employer because I may have other obligations. Me one, employer zero. I open up my own company, buy a domain, make a web page, start calling, writing, and letting people know I'm available for consulting. Of course, I checked with the union lawyers beforehand if this was okay, which it was, totally fine. They told me that since my employer laid me off and rehired me part-time, I could do what I wanted with the rest of my time. This would not have been the case if I'd requested part-time employment. Great. I go to work for myself then. Me too, employer zero. Almost immediately after our new contracts take effect, my employer starts noticing there's more than enough work to go around and asks me to work more hours. No, I say. Unfortunately, I have other obligations. I really didn't. I was just making a stand, forcing them to recognize their own mistake. Time passes. My savings account drains in about three months' time, but we managed to cut down on our expenses, so it's not rough seas, but still not smooth sailing by far. Income's a bit on the low side, although I managed to get some consulting done in my own time. I switch from sourdough bread to stale, boring white bread. Go from good beer to Bud Light to no beer. What you have to do, you have to do. No more fine roasted coffee from the small shop on the corner. Only what sludge I can get at the supermarket and brew at home. Ugh. But this is temporary, I tell myself. And then it happens. I get a big job and start moonlighting to get it done. Work evenings and weekends... This is when crap hit the fan because word got out. I get an angry phone call from Mrs. G's boss, Mr. V, and we have a heated conversation over what I can and cannot do. The conversation was something like this, in short terms. Mr. V, think of how this reflects on our company. Me, that's not my concern here, Mr. V. I have bills to pay and mouths to feed. Mr. V, this is not what we had in mind. Me, hey, you laid me off, man. You should know the rules of the game. You can't dictate what I do in my spare time. Perhaps you should have thought it through when you reduced my hours. You think I was happy to lose income and wouldn't try to remedy my financial situation? Mr. V. You can work more hours for us then. Me. I have other obligations now. Can't let down my customers. Mr. V. Very angry now. You should consider your next steps carefully, young man. Me. Mr. V. I shall do that. Thank you for calling. You pompous P, I silently added. What then followed was a phone call from me to my union explaining the situation. Later that week, my employer got a phone call from the union lawyers who spoke to Mr. V and HR department 
telling them what they can and cannot do. And I just kept working for myself. Mr. V is now very unhappy, stops greeting me when we pass each other in the hallway. Me three, employer zero. Two months later, I hand in my resignation. Three months after that, I'm gone, and to rub salt in the wounds, something remarkable happens. My coworker, not our mentor, mind you, asks if I'd want to partner up and start a new company together. Yes, I say, it was a great idea. Coworker hands in resignation a month after I handed mine in, and we start working in our own company full time. People that depend on our services are very happy about us entering the market as independent consultants. Business takes off. Me slash us for employer zero. The aftermath. My former employer has had an opening for our job since August 2020. Our mentor told me last month he's finally put down his foot and is retiring at the end of the year as he's turning 70 soon. They will thus have gone from three people in a very niche field to zero in less than two years because of bad managerial decisions. It did not come as a surprise to me there were no others available in the market since it's a niche field and I know almost every person personally. So I could have told them that everybody seemed happy with their current employer. Being a manager must suck. Oh wait, that's me now. Companies hate it when they actually have to suffer from their dubious actions. You should consider your next steps carefully, young man. How dare you? Hey guys, thank you for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.